thanks everybody for coming. I'm here to introduce, oh my gosh, I whole flies in. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I should know that. But you guys are experiencing pronouncing very difficult names, so I appreciate We try. Um, so I'll read his bio and then I'm gonna <coughs> say a couple things of my own. Um, he says that in 1980, he finally founded Scientific Art Studio. After teaching biology, chemistry, and physics for a few years, he decided to follow his desire to create natural history exhibits. There was not really a job in which he could explore and combine his interests in taxidermy, wildlife photography, film, design, history, paleontology, geology, sculpture, painting, engineering, teaching, and be an inventor all at the same time, <coughs> which I'm sure a lot of you can identify with. Um, he's always had the need to involve himself in a wide range of fields and to challenge himself with interesting projects. The result is Scientific Art Studio as it is now. During the last 35 years, under the name of Scientific Art Studio, he's been able to take on a really wide variety of projects, from natural history exhibits to special effects for motion pictures and television, from museum taxidermy to mechanical costumes for a Vegas show, and the restoration of artifacts to the design of rock, so rock show stages. The source of his inspiration and the focus of his interest has been always nature in its broadest embrace. It gives him great satisfaction to reconstruct extinct animals and plants and to work with scientific specialists and to dabble in whatever draws his attention, which sounds like the perfect job to me. Um, I met Ron doing an outreach fellowship in Sitka, Alaska in 2013. Um, I was up there to do some research and um, practice my outreach skills, and Ron was reconstructing a killer whale from a skeleton of a, a baby, basically, that was yeah. stranded. Um, and so he worked with the high school students to make this really awesome reconstruction of this whale, and then now it's hanging in the, um, in the science museum there. And it was really neat to work with him and go out in the field with him, and then when I came back to California, I was able to visit his studio, which is awesome, really interesting stuff. So I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to tell us today about combining science and art. Thanks for coming. Is this working? Can everybody hear me? Yeah? Okay, uh, so what uh, I didn't had no idea that Alison was going to basically tell the whole story, so I'm kind of done. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and it's for me, I had no idea what I would walk into, uh, uh, because uh, Alison said, can you do this? I said, yeah, yes, I didn't, of course, I didn't look into what, what the, the audience would be. Um, I, I always wanted to do reconstructions of prehistoric creatures. I feel s myself prehistoric now, seeing all these people that probably were not born yet when I was trying to do my first reconstruction in 1980. So, uh, no, and that's great. So, um, and uh, it also made me realize that some of the things that I will say uh, will be what my son would be uh, uh, describe as dead jokes, like, <laughs> and you know all what that is. So uh, if that happens, my apologies. So um, let me see if I can get this thing running. Uh, it is, yeah. It is like uh, Allison already. Let me see if it's now. It worked. Uh, it worked five minutes ago. So. Oh, no. The play button. Okay. Yeah. See, that's that's like that. That prehistoric feeling comes really. And um, I can only say I was here Saturday uh, in uh, Lovers Point scuba diving. Uh, you know, it's freezing cold, but it's amazing to be underwater. Uh, my wife, Marin here, that I have Scientific Art Studio with, uh, she was kayaking, and we just walked down the beach. We saw, you know, pelicans and, uh, and sea lions doing all kinds of interesting behavior, you know? So you guys, first of all, I think you're very lucky that you can do that here. The second thing is that whatever you do, even if you, you know, you say maybe there's not a career or there's no money, you say, what you're doing is absolutely important and, uh, you know, uh, the ocean is the future and, wait a second here, it should, it should be running now, what is going on? 
it did something, right? All right. No, sorry. Um, okay. So I'm doing it just by hand. Uh, so what what you're doing is absolutely uh, essential for the future of, uh, of human beings. If we think that human beings are worth staying around, because that's all we can have a debate about that too. Uh, um, so when um, Alison asked me to talk about scientific art and scientific art in 1980 I came up with this name scientific art studio in the Netherlands and um, I probably should take, put my notes up because it started making sense uh, eventually um, okay so um, So, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, bring to your attention that I'm from Holland. I grew up in Amsterdam, um, so that means that uh, anything that sounds stupid or silly that uh, has a good reason. So, um, uh, the, our, our, my company, uh, which was started as basically as a hobby, uh, started in the Netherlands. And, uh, since I w have always been a very contrary character because I grew up in Amsterdam, 1960s, uh, people uh, always had were against something or uh, came up with all, all kinds of alternative uh, ideas of how to do things. That influenced me strongly. And uh, this is me while I'm 14. Uh, people say always, what did your mother say when you were doing this? I said she was sitting next to me there. <laughs> so that, that, that is Holland. Um, all right, so um, I will try to make this more serious. Uh, for, my first, for my first memories, uh, I have been experiment, experimenting. Uh, the first thing was, of course, the, what anything you could find under the kitchen cabinet was and try to mix that. Um, so that was, uh, that was like a wonderful thing. But, and I had to go through the Dutch school system. The Dutch school system is very interesting. You, you don't choose, you go kind of in four or five or six different directions that you can go and you can move horizontally and you, so there's always another option. My trajectory, uh, I never made a final choice, and I ended up with being a uh, teacher in biology, chemistry, physics, and animal husbandry. You can see the meadows in the background. Uh, and uh, that was my only very temporary job as a teacher. So I found out that I was unemployable. What, what I needed, what I wanted was to do in life was it just did not fit in a narrow career path. And um, I think this earth is a good example uh, to see that there are limitless opportunities. And you guys are all exploring those at this very moment. There's too much to see in this world. Uh, and uh, I quit my position as a, as a teacher and uh, started stuffing squirrels um, as to make a living. Right, and it, see, there is, it seems that there, there is this unlimited demand for uh, gray squirrels. I, I, that is somewhere in, but I never walked into anybody's living room and I sa saw a, squ a gray squirrel. Uh, I, I did hundreds of them and <laughs> I, 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 have, I have no idea where they are now, but be, besides, Besides doing these gray squirrels, I stuffed all kinds of un other animals, which is wonderful because for my uh, kind of experience with anatomy, polar bears, giraffes, chimpanzees, uh, what, whatever uh, animal you can imagine, I always uh, have, in one way or another, I have had my hands on, living or dead. Uh, I, when I was, my father, he was, uh, a heating mechanic, and I grew up in a, a family of very uh, minimally educated people just after the war. Uh, and, uh, but he had two books, Burton, uh, 
And in, that, in those books, there were beautiful images of prehistoric animals. And that started my interest in reconstructions, or what, it's so, this, these were actually beautiful images. And then in 1968, there was in Holland this magazine called Kijk, means look, uh, and that covered all kinds of pre stories about um, stories about prehistory, about Thor Heyerdahl on, the, on his balsa raft. So there was a lot of stuff that uh, I had uh, to, uh, yeah, that's me too, um, in probably 1982. So I really uh, w wanted to, so I really was interested and I started in this small shed and I convinced people that they should buy reconstructions of prehistoric animals, which was in that time um, um, not that common in the Netherlands. So the most people, the, the jobs that were available were at museums, and every, every job available in the machine was already taken by a guy that was there since he started, and he was now like 55, and he would never leave because it was gold, right? You know those situations. <laughs> like, when do they move up? So there is for the new generation. It doesn't happen. So I started my own uh, business. And, uh, I, and when I started, I had no idea what, how much trouble I would get into, just like I didn't know when Allison contacted me what, what the trouble was that I would get myself into by starting to study what it means to do scientific art. Um, putting, putting science and, um, and art into the same bucket, as if these two would, you could mix those in 1980, was actually pretty ballsy. At that time, uh, with the, the fact that I had no degree in science and also never felt it necessary that I would go to an art academy to become an official artist, uh, and I calling my own company Scientific Art Studio was, um, yeah, that was beyond ballsy. It was actually completely reckless. People would uh, tell me, why do you use an English name in Holland? We're in Holland here. Why don't you call it Wetenschappelijke Kunstwerkplaats? <laughs> um, nou ja, you know why. Um, what you're doing is not science because you're not an official scientist. Or what you're doing is not art, because you're not an uh, official artist. And, uh, but I was stubborn. I showed that picture earlier. And I kept at, at it. And I feel, spe especially when I moved into the, walked into this building, that, uh, that the trends have caught up, and that people start understanding that science and art are very great partners. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm like, you know, for example, this quilt, I hate quilts. That is one of the things. It's like cutting a perfectly good piece of fabric in little pieces, sew it back together. Now, I mean, but in, 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 in this case, it, it's phenomenal. I love it. I, I'm, re, I'm uh, converted. Um, all right. So. Let me see where I'm here, but I'm just, OK. So by getting into uh, calling my company Scientific Arts, so you kept doing these models and reconstructions, I got into contact with all kinds of interesting uh, scientists, you know, like Dr. John Johansson in Berkeley, which is a great guy. I don't know where he's now, but he moved to Arizona. I think he's back. This was when he was very young. And here am I, being very young, working at Lucy. And on the right hand side, we're working on uh, Homo erectus, or uh, reconstruction based on skeletons. Uh, Dr. Hansen helped me with a lot of dimensions and talks. And uh, this was uh, my version of Lucy. Uh, I thought she should be very smart and, uh, and very handsome. So I think uh, that worked there. And then also, I'm working with artists. So like this guy here, Mark Dion, if you're into natural history like art, which is now considered modern art, you know, realistic human beings, uh, stuffed animals. Mark, I work with him on several projects. We just did a, 
project in Holland, a gigantic lingcot head as a fountain that, that I think 11 feet high, you know, we, we modeled it in the computer here, emailed it to Holland, machined it there, supervised it, installed it. So I just saw that lingcot is a pretty popular fish in here in the Monterey, right? And I saw one while I was diving. So, um, so <coughs> this is me again. Sorry, this is, yeah, somehow it, it, I had no idea that the stuff that, that was scientific art I was doing in early 1980s and that it would be such a time warp thing for me. So uh, this was uh, when I was working on my earliest reconstructions. It was before the World Wide Web, right? So that meant that uh, it would, be would have been great to have the World Wide Web, but uh, I, uh, when I had to do, for example, a re reconstruction of a pteranodon, which is a gigantic flying uh, reptile, there was no uh, Google pteranodon or go Google science and find all the publications online. I had to find people who were actually spent months on research. Um, I'm jealous of you guys because you guys have like it all on your fingertips. So the production of data and information must explode, right? It's so efficient. So it's nowadays uh, easier to uh, to to uh, oh yeah, this sorry that this is this is an interruption. So from that from that little shed, <coughs> at a certain point, I I always wanted to have big space. So. I found this uh, church from 1861 in uh, is a Mennonite church, and I converted it to my studio. And that was uh, just before I did the project in Taiwan, and I met Marin there. So I left the church behind and the business, and I moved here. So and I started at an, back in my small shed. I was basically. <laughs> Um, but uh, it was great. So, if, so it's easier. I don't know why I put this one in, but it's much easier now to uh, to to collect data, like you all know. You know, it's like all these images in one way or another are art, and they're explaining something about science. So there was lists of things about scientific art, opinions, research, all this. I had no idea. So by the time, by this time. I um, realized that talking about scientific art was, I needed more time to study it. I didn't know anything about scientific art. So what comes from now on will be just projects that I worked on and how I did them. I will not say that, that I can say what is scientific art. Scientific art is a big field and it expands all the time. So there's a Discover magazine, Fine Art in America. So. Uh, there's no more discussion. Apparently, science and art are connected. So, yeah, you know, like here, this is another one. So, in the end, uh, I also don't know why I use this image here. No, so, all right. So, this was the story. So, I expected a bunch of very serious. You guys, I know you're all serious, but uh, very. Uh, very uh, scientists, that this kind of scientists that I used to encounter, who would be, you know, I would not say aggressive, but definitely uh, that was that would completely discard anything I would say because I was not a real scientist, right? Or I was need, not a real artist. So I would, I thought I would move, walk into a room. You've never seen this movie, maybe, but Kentucky Fried Movie with Woody Allen. Uh, I cannot show the, the clip because it's, uh, but I, uh, uh, I, I, th I wanted to use it and say this is like, like Rex Kramer, danger seeker. I walk into a room with scientists and I try to explain the connection between science and art. So this, now I see that that was completely futile to use this slide. But uh, let, me, uh, let me just approach uh, talking about all these projects that I've been working on the way I approach every project. Uh, I just jump off and see where we go. Uh, because, you know, what can go wrong? I mean, it's like, uh, the first uh, project, the case study, and 
I had to reconstruct imagery from 30 plus years ago. So maybe not everything is good, but I start every, every project, I start with research of the publications, like, just like you do. Like this is for an art, the, the art approach. I just wanted to uh, show the parallels to uh, science approach. So I tried to find uh, these, uh, these, these panther and the leopard and the um, uh, jaguar skulls are irrelevant for this photo. They were just on my desk because I'm doing this 12 foot uh, long uh, black panther for a school. So, um, and, the, and the bobby roos and the crocodile jaw is also irrelevant. So. Um, but um, I was asked for a zoo in the Netherlands uh, to do a, uh, a Pteranodon ingens, which now is called Longiceps because they keep changing, you know, the name is ongoing, right? That you think an animal is called this, then somebody discovers its family of another animal, so it, okay, ingens. It's about 20 feet wingspan flying reptile. Uh, and since I did this sculpture in the 80s, a lot of research has happened. There are like hundreds of fossils have been found. But um, this was originally, this animal was originally discovered in um, somewhere in the 1800s by Marsh. And I, I found the publications about that. Uh, in, uh, in the 70s, a bat expert and an aeronautical engineer went to came together and start uh, thinking, how can these animals fly 20 feet wingspan? How is it possible? So they started applying all kinds of uh, math to it. They did mock-ups and models, uh, very scientific. And I used that information as well. I went to Munich, where I was a specialist in this uh, specific creature. I, this is not what I did. This is in Munich. This is done by uh, the team of Professor Wellenhover, who, is the, who was studied Archaeopteryx. And, uh, and I talked to him, and I you know, got his impressions and ideas. And this is from those, uh, the bat and uh, the aeronautical uh, engineer. Uh, they did all these uh, wind tunnel tests. And so based on that, I evolved uh, this uh, life-size model in which we had, uh, I had also the help of a friend of ours who was a geology, doc, doctor in geology. Guy drank and smoked and told amazing stories. So that was, that was like exactly the old style scientist that you want to meet to gather good information. So uh, he had discovered this uh, in, in a box of, of uh, rocks. Uh, a uh, shoulder part and two vertebrae of an, uh, a flying reptile from Brazil. And he was able to reconstruct the skeleton, a full skeleton of that species that he named, Santana ductilis brasiliensis. And he was so nice to share all the data and information with me and cast of the bones. And so I used that to create this uh, life-like li reconstruction of a pteranodon. And the unique thing was this had to hang in a greenhouse with living crocodiles in the water there that Barbie stand next to. And uh, it was like sprayed by water, and it was, so it had to last. Uh, and it had to be light, and it had to be so. So I had to come up with all these solutions of how to make that membrane work and still create it, make it translucent. Um, so yeah, that is all the fun of creating these, uh, these lifelike uh, animals. Um, let me see here. Is there any questions? I mean, in the meantime, you, you, you see it like, oh, I, uh, this has nothing to do with ocean, of course. But uh, <laughs> these were flying in, in, the, in, the, in the, the, the inland sea of the United States. That, that's why they are preserved. So there is an ocean connection, right? To uh, make that, and what methods you use to shape the Yeah, okay. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, this was a, this 
was the first creature I've done on this scale. Um, I created, I created a, life, a, a, a life size, a one-to-one -one drawing of all the bones. Then I took those bones that this friend of mine had done for his Santana ductilis and compared like the joints and everything and I extrapolated it. So for example here, you know, this is, this is, this connection here has to be a certain size because of the, so I, then you take a piece of plywood, you cut the silhouette out, um, and then you, the, the shoulder ring is, is, it's like it's one thing, the clavicle and the scapulas are one solid ring. There's no flexibility. So you make all those parts, put foam on it. At that time, polyurethane foam, two parts, pour it, and then you carve it. And then I sculpted the, the surface with wood putty. At that time, I thought it was a brilliant idea. I would never do it again because the fumes make you really feeling funny all the time. So. Uh, <laughs> And, and that was when he still had putty with solvents in it. It was like, um, and then I had to make, I would sculpt one side of the wing because it, this thing didn't fit in my shop. I, th I only had enough space for the half the animal. So I, I made the ha one half, made a mold of it out of silicone and a, a cap, you know, not a plaster, but a fiberglass shell. Then I, took that wing off and did the other one. And then in the end, I cast all of that in, you know, like a boat, basically you have layers of fiberglass and carbon fiber and aluminum. And, and then I assembled it. The neighbor had a fur coat that she didn't want anymore. So one of those artificial fur coats and I glued that on it as hair. Um, and that's kind of, and it still exists, like, after, like for all these years, it's still in a, in a, in a zoo somewhere. Um, but I would check back in with these scientists all the time. So it was not that this crazy artist dude was making this up. No, this, every week, these artists, this, this scientist would come by and say, yeah, but I mean, I, I think that beak is not, it should be lighter or narrower or, uh, and, and the biggest, uh, my biggest problem was like most drawings show the, the, the flying membrane at the knee while that meant that you cannot really, really maneuver the, the flying, the skin to, but like a bed does or, and so I attached it here. Uh, yeah, there's like all kinds of stuff that, can you see like, so normally Normally, I mean, I, the moment I did this thing, I saw another drawing of the skin here, right? Uh, the internet was not there, so I could not, it would just come to me. Um, but, um, yeah, so, and I also made it uh, not, not symmetrical. I pulled one wing in a little bit, so he starts, you know, uh, f flying around the corner. Um, then that same zoo, um, that this is in a building called the Biogron, um, and um, in Emmen, no, in north of Holland. I don't, anybody been in Holland ever? All right, now you, <laughs> you okay. Uh, go there, it's an interesting place. And uh, we love the ocean. So I was just realizing how important the ocean is to me. I was born 30 feet below sea level. In, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. If you can get out of Schiphol Airport, there's like a pole 30 feet tall and it shows that you're 30 feet underwater. Um, that's why at this level I have uh, always slight altitude sickness. <laughs> um, uh, when I was walking the beach here, it was like <sighs> um, Okay, so this, muse this zoo had a, was on a, on a roll. They were building all these new buildings. They had an, a South America uh, aviary. They have an African building with not only animals, but plants and the people. Not like isolate, like you have a, you know, you have a little a lizard sitting in a, in a, cave, in a, in a, a terrarium, but that lizard is re has something to do with this plant and they all have a hard time because these people are having their cattle grazing uh, in that area. So that 
kind of like the bigger thinking of uh, how ecology, uh, bigger, you know, like it was 1980 again, so in Holland. So we had to, that, that kind of thinking was a nice, w a new way of presenting uh, uh, nature to visitors, you know, who only come there because the chimpanzee is so funny and looks like their uncle. No, that, that was, that was not anymore. It was, we've tried to explain the, the, the coherence of nature. So one of the things they did, they wanted to build an evolution museum, show the history of life on Earth. And we're part of that, right? We're only, we're, in, we're not even in the middle of it because eternity is per definition longer than the big, from here to the Big Bang. So we have a lot ahead of us still. Um, they wanted to do an evolution museum. The, the problem was there were the local zealots didn't want it to be named Evolution Museum. So uh, they gave in and called it the Biogron, which is basically the chronology of life, which is kind of an evolution museum. So they got, a, they got around that. Um, and I had been working for them independently for, on, that, on all kinds of other stuff. Um, and uh, so what I... What they wanted, they wanted a reconstruction of a carboniferous uh, forest diorama. And uh, it was a huge space, bigger than this and four times as high, uh, filled with real ferns and real water and real lycopodiums and reconstructions of these plants. So that I had to first start studying all these, the plants, right? What kind of plants could be in there and then how, so I had all these old books like, you know, uh, my French was never so that good, but I was able to, uh, to use it. And then I built this diorama out of wood dowels, uh, and everything you see here was going to be built as reconstructions. Uh, I, the first picture you saw was an impressions of Cicularia. There was like a lot of coal mines in the south of Holland, a lot of uh, carboniferous uh, plants and imprints, so I collected that, I, uh, and then started making these reconstructions out of uh, whatever I could from fiberglass. So everything you see here is made plants. Uh, in the background is uh, Lepidodendron, uh, there's big horse tails here. Uh, Medulosa is a kind of a, the first uh, plant that had some kind of flower-like environment. And uh, you know, these things are like 20, 30 feet tall, so it gives you, uh, that was one of those moments I dove off the cliff and uh, had to figure out how to build it because I never had done anything with fiberglass. But, so I was working with this uh, scientist who was a paleobotanist and they, the zoo had them, hired him to work together with me and we worked really together really well. But in, if you're building something like this, um, the problem is that there are more questions come up than can be answered by anybody. So I would have a list of questions like, what about this? How does that fall? How does it rot away? Is that layer of bark, if that goes away, what do you see then? And, and the guy would, every week it was like, uh, I will be back on that next week. So then he had to go back and study up. And we're, but in the end, it became a wonderful uh, experience. Um, this gives you a little bit of the scale. Um, there was a problem. Uh, this is, I'm, I think that this is me sitting here with a friend and we were just looking at, like we spent months, you know, gluing every single needle on these, on these branches were glued to, on one by one uh, by my family, by the neighbors, anybody <laughs> were sitting there at the table gluing hair, like, uh, and all these ferns were make, made. And we're sitting there, and there's this, uh, this lady in a big fur coat, in a zoo. You walk around in a fur coat, let me. Uh, walks up with a little boy. I'm, I'm, uh, I fear it was her son. Uh, and she said, oh, nothing here, just plants, and turns around and <laughs> walks out of the space. So that moment, I knew that spending my life doing reconstructions of plants and dioramas uh, is not the way to attract zoo uh, visitors. So, 
Um, so what we, what we did to solve the problem is like a, a big, big uh, trunk somewhere here. And the, oh, I don't know why I threw that one in. That is me working on a Dimetrodon uh, for a museum in uh, Taiwan. Oh, this is, this, is, this, this is the Demetrius done in front of my mother's curtains. <laughs> uh, um, so the zoo was lucky enough to have hired a spider specialist because they were going to do a spider exhibit with all kinds of, you know, nafila. I don't know if there are any spider. It's all ocean stuff here, right? Okay. And then you don't know anything about anything else but the ocean. Is that the way it is? Okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, they, the, that specialist had somehow laid his hand on a cast of a fossil of a spider from Argentina, and the spider was about this, the fossil of the spider was about this big. That's why they called it Mega Rachna, you know, it was a big spider. So I, I created, so this spider was uh, created, uh, let me see if there's, no, well, let me uh, go back here. This spider, I, I had the publication, I had the drawings, I sculpted it, cast it, the resin, all that stuff. I, uh, I walked into somebody's house and they had a cactus sitting uh, in a planter. And I said, that cactus is dead. I said, no, it's not that. So I pick it up, and it was completely hollow. You know how that goes. And it you think your cactus is perfect, and then it's dead for years. <laughs> so I got the cactus. I used the, the, the beautiful spines with the little ribs on it to, to glue in the back of the spider. Uh, I used thousands of little insect needles to put hairs on the legs. And we put that in the... Uh, Carboniferous diorama. The whole effect changed. Suddenly there was this spider there, there was a focus, Peter's, people loved it. I cannot believe how much money was thrown at that spider into the diorama to make it move. It was like gold mine. Um, I also did the uh, Arthropleura, that is like a big. Uh, like millipede, and there's still discussion, is that, is that an aquatic animal or a land animal? The big mistake that I did with this one, I used the head of a current modern uh, millipede, and that turned out to be completely wrong. So this is a reconstruction, and the one point where I went off, there was no part to be found, I did it wrong. So can, I just want to let you know this, like, you ha that is okay as long as you let everybody know it is wrong because uh, there are too many scientists that have a hard time admitting that they were wrong. So, yeah? Oh yeah, there's like six feet. And what I, what I tr so the same technique, we sculpt it and then cast it and then we, I try to create translucency by, for example, cast all the feet in a, in a dental acrylic clear acrylic, like what you use for your teeth, with a colorant in it. Um, yeah, so this is more or less, this is more or less life science, yeah. How many hours of labor? Yeah, that's, I, please. <laughs> I mean, um, peop, when people see all this, they say, this guy must have made a ton of money, right? And I did, but I also spent it. On all, we have like 11 artists at our studio, and you can imagine that somebody's sitting there gluing hairs. It's, it's, and we cannot help ourselves. We have to make it as detailed as possible. These are just a couple of photos of animals. Then this, that same zoo wanted to do animal, uh, mammals. This is uh, Argeotherium, like a pig-like uh, thing. This model is like this big. So it's like a foot long. Uh, Metaminodon also, and this is a different technique. I used uh, that stuff that they make doll heads out. It's like DAS or Darwi or, so I, I do make an armature sculpted on there and then with a little tool I carve the skin texture and then I paint it. Uh, but yeah, it's a gr great material because it's not toxic, it doesn't stink. And I had to do that on 
in the little apartment of my then girlfriend. Uh, I would do it here in the time that I was here, take him back to Holland where I still had my business. So this was in between others. And this is uh, Brontotherium. This is like life size. Uh, also sculpted out of the same material. So, and then we make a mold and cast it. Uh, and then I, so I used, I went actually to the Berkeley Library uh, of uh, paleontology and they, they had all these different publications about, and then I used the muscle drawings. Um, I'm, we're now going a little random here. So, um, Ichthyosaurus, uh, and oh yeah, here's the same picture of that mega rock now again. Uh, I based this on a fossil from uh, Holzmaden in Germany. Uh, another marine creature, right? That is not here anymore. But uh, I used the, the the. I was inspired by mackerel uh, for the color of the animal. It was like I love that the way these patterns on a mackerel, you know, the shimmery stuff. So I tried to uh, kind of use that uh, because it's easy to make them all blue or gray. But I thought this was uh, more attractive. Oh, this is uh, coelacan, uh, had lived, had, had lived, had been stored in alcohol for 20 years, the mold was made, and I reconstructed it uh, because it was completely like distorted and like that, so uh, this went also to a museum. Oh, this is uh, the AP Ornus. Um, this, this project, the other projects were all in the Netherlands because uh, that's where my business was. I moved here, and then some people tracked me down and said, we want an AP Ornus, which is a, uh, a giant bird from Madagascar. It's, uh, you can, they still find the eggs there, or little, it's, but it's extinct, it's like since the 1600s or 1500s. Um, this was, yeah, we're running out of, I'm sorry, I have too much stuff to, to show here, but um, I, at that time, you, now I can buy a skeleton, a, a cast of a skeleton, and I would use that as a reference. At that time, I used fo drawings of publications and then uh, interpolated that with living uh, cassowary or emu. Or stuff. So, uh, and I wanted to use real feathers uh, to give it a more realistic effect. And uh, in the past, I had used cassowary feathers, but I needed about 20, and cassowary are pretty uh, rare, so I couldn't do that. But at that time, there was a new trend uh, that farmers were starting to raise emus. And uh, that since then, it has the, the market has tanked for emu meat. Uh, but at that time, it was emu, the new red meat. And uh, I would get these brochures from the emu association, emu oil, life just got better. I mean, I don't know what, 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 what their plan was, but it, was, it, was, it has not worked. But uh, um, so I bought these 16 skins from a, basically a slaughterhouse for emus. And I cut little plugs of it and spent weeks gluing plug by plug emu feathers on that uh, AP Ornus. And then it was shipped to the Netherlands. So it's now in a museum in the Netherlands. Um, and they're happy. So, but besides uh, all these animal models, I also get people who come to me and say, "Can you do a, a medical model or a scientific model?" So this this is for Medtronic. It's a company that does stands and heart valves and all this stuff. They come up with these devices, and then they want me to make a demo model that is ten times as big. So they any because normally it's like this big, right? Like here, you this is for example, you have a stent in your artery, and then your body wants to say, hey, there's a stent in my artery, let's enclose that with cells, so then your artery is back to close, so they try to prevent that. This was a little model that showed, uh, they call it late loss. Uh, and always I have, the moment I start working with like an, an engineer or a specialist, they use words I have never heard in my life, right? Because all these people at Medtronic know exactly what I mean by, you know, enth enthelial, regrowth or, or uh, late loss or, you know, all that. Um, but I have to very quickly to kind of learn the lingo, the same with scientists, you have to kind of learn the words they use and the abbreviations. 
and then work with them to, so they understand what they want to show. Here, they wanted to just show you have now your artery is all clogged up. You put the stent in, you expand him, opens the artery, but then you get this regrowth. And they put uh, a regrowth uh, inhibiting chemical in that stand so that would not happen. So that was the story. So, and here you see, uh, here is a real stand here, and this is the model. Uh, so I had to figure out materials to see if it has the same flexibility when it's big compared to the little one. So that salesman can show, look how wonderful ours bends. Uh, and it's not like a piece of steel staying. So that's all kinds of very interesting stuff. Allison, where are you? Okay, this is where Allison, uh, I met Allison in uh, Sitka. It was fun, we were on boats and all that stuff. Sitka, they had found this dead killer baby, killer whale baby, and they wanted to have that, they had a skeleton of a killer whale, uh, yeah, killer whale, orca, uh, in their museum, and they wanted the baby as a model. But they already, of course, these people there have, had been already cut it up in little pieces. So we could not do a mold or so. So I said, send me what you have. So they sent me, you know, the fluke, and uh, okay, let me, the fluke and the head and the, the fins, the flippers, and I, in order, so they were all frozen, shipped from Alaska, made the molds, put them in the freezer, waiting until I had to send them back, and I, at least I had the reference material for the parts that we had, and from there we extrapolated uh, in the computer the the whale, the baby again. And then I machine, we have a computer controlled router, so we routered pieces, so at least we we're in the, the right realm of dimensional correctness. Then I hand carved it to, uh, to look like a baby killer whale. And then we put a primer on it, and then Marin here uh, painted it, because we also took a lot of reference photos of, uh, of uh, the colors. Uh, so now this is the way it hangs in uh, Sitka. So um, this is here in the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, a couple of years ago, I was contacted, can you do a couple of uh, jellyfish models? And I love to do uh, something like that because the translucency of, and the, basically you have creatures that are invisible underwater, and then you have to make a model of it. Like, how do you do that? So. Um, yeah, I, I found this poster in, uh, during my internet research. So I, I thought, and this is a very blurry photo of Pirivella, but you guys know that, right? That is, uh, okay. Um, I did stu I study it. I went to Embari, met with uh, Steve Haddock. He showed me in little jars real animals. Uh, it's amazing how few specimens there are actually in jars that you can look at, right? It's like there's no collecting anymore going on. There used to be that whole expeditions would go to the jungles of somewhere and come back with all kinds of interesting species. No, you can, with a swap of DNA, that's about it. So all this exciting stuff, uh, I, I'm, maybe I'm completely wrong, but no, there's no money anymore for expeditions. Okay. Uh, so I did a lot, you know, there's like, I did hundreds of sketches to kind of figure out how do all these parts go together. I contacted specialists. I said, yeah, I'm special, I'm, my specialization is the speed of the little harpoon that jumps out of a tentacle of a jellyfish, the speed of that, I know all about it, but I have no idea how the water flows through this thing. Or, and if you make a model, you have to know all of that because otherwise it's not correct. So. Uh, what helped was this guy, Hegel, in the eight, late 1800s, scientific artist. And we don't, do we have to say more? This was a scientific artist, right? Uh, I was, uh, he, the way he did these drawings, this explained how all this stuff went together because you cannot see it on a photo. Or you cannot see it on a, a detail. So I used a lot of that and I, uh, and this kind of stuff, explaining what all these parts were, there are, 
there are parts of jellyfish that's the only, there's only one jellyfish with one organ and that, that organ has a word that is only for that one organ. So, I mean, it's like that specific, right? Um, so, and then we started modeling the parts based on what we knew and casting it in rotational, we built a rotational casting machine so we could do hollow clear casts and then the, the gonads are in there and all the internal organs are in there um, and I had these special domes blown so they had the right curve and then these are acrylic rods that I ground down and heated up in front of a heat lamp so we could we could uh, we could uh, bend them any way we wanted this is bentocodon um, I saw beautiful pictures and in the background uh, what is that? Does anybody know? No? It's uh, Physophora uh, hydrostatica. Uh, so yeah, this. So all these these. So this was installed in place. Uh, this Marin is here painting a uh, lion mane jelly uh, that was supposed to be a bench. So we had to cast it in soft rubber, and then she painted it on the inside. So this is like. Uh, like this big. I can tell a whole story about how we had to make that. So this is a very... Uh, Gironex, uh, the box jelly without its tentacles yet. And here are at least three of them. Um, I just love those. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I want to say, we have five minutes. Uh, let me see, because I'm completely messed up here. That's the problem. You cannot let, let me. So the last thing I would like to say that uh, our studio, uh, our motto is uh, Natura, uh, Artis Natura Magistra. Uh, nature is the teacher of art. And uh, I believe, I'm convinced that nature is also the teacher of science, of course. So uh, if we want to discuss science, art, I think if they're not brothers, they're at least very closely related, especially in the observation, the processing of the data, and how you express it. So that's about it. I, I only left uh, five minutes for questions. Did you experiment with 3D printing? Yes. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> I don't know. Yes, now we don't even experiment with it. We use it. <laughs> it's not, so what we, for example, these jellyfish, I would love to model in the, in the computer and clear print them, right? That would be awesome if we can make them any scale. Yes? I gave a seminar last semester and we made little small scale models of plankton using uh -huh. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, they said that these machines, uh, you know, prints, and it's, it's not that. That it's not it's not that easy. People think, oh yeah, now we can print my hamburger for tonight. No, that is we're not there yet. <laughs> it's, it may happen, and I like the whole process of making a hamburger. But um, for those models, yes, it's a beautiful technique. Also for insect models with the hairs and everything, you can model those and then print them. Yes, I love it. We have a couple of them. The moment you buy them, they're outdated. It's like. <laughs> visual cameras and software, so, um, but uh, we use it, yes. And we also have the CNC machine that we can machine big pieces. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have a favorite medium to work in? It sounds like a lot of what you do is very multimedia, like emu feathers and clay and I, I just, like I, like I did when I was two years old, clay is still, it's lovely, right? And sand, sitting on the beach. And kids don't experience that too much anymore. But yeah, the natural materials, water, clay, plaster, I love that. Uh, but, you know, I haven't found the, the super transparent clay yet that I can make a jellyfish out of, for example. So then we have to refer to all this amazing stuff that we have available. Okay, I have two questions. My first question is, are you still taking squirrel commissions? <laughs> what, what do I do? Are you still taking squirrel commissions? All of us would like a Squirrels, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm like, 
I, I had to do 20 a day <laughs> to make a living. So every night I would get to my freezer, take 20 of these little guys out, and then in the morning I had to skin them. They were freezing cold, first of all. And then by the end of the day I had to, they all had to sit there smiling at me. And then, like, it, was, it was a horrible, it's t I'm tr still traumatized. Okay, okay, my real question though is since you mentioned like you're dealing with scientists and specialists who are so specialized that they deal with like this one stinging cell and this one aspect, but you as an artist have to have this really integrated view of what you're doing. That's kind of what you're there to do is to communicate the whole picture to mm -hmm. the public. So how do you overcome all this piecemeal information? Yeah, and you, you, a model Basically, a mo good model starts with a good amount of research. Otherwise, you know, sometimes I have some, okay, you have this done next week. Yeah, then there's no research, right? But if you have the time, then it's just talking to all these people and I say, hey, this guy said, or this woman said, this about this jellyfish. And then they say, yeah, but, you know, I've worked on it and this, you, you, I just piece it together. And that's why all these drawings, right? Or I send a drawing to a scientist and say, what do you think of this? And then I get a whole bunch of notes on it. So it's interpretation. And sometimes it's just, you know it's not right. You think this animal can never, this cannot be like this. And then you kind of go back and you say, there's a problem here, what do you think? The best thing is just to have the dead animal or the living animal, but that is not, off with the prehistoric animals, it's not that easy. But. It's getting easier because you can actually scan the, the fossils in the rock and then reconstruct the pieces without having to take it out of the rock. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that have happened since 1984. Right? We didn't know that we were ending up in 1984. But. I have a question which is maybe philosophical. Do you, do you draw a distinction between art and illustration. And, and the second question is, how, how do you see scientific art in the broader context of fine art? Um, I think uh, illustration is, a, is, is, is an essential part of uh, recording what you see. You can, you can take you know, all kinds of photos, but if you do a good illustration, it, it for, for education or for scientific communication, you can emphasize it or you can pull it out. Uh, uh, like if you scan somebody's brain or his head, there's so much data, you have to dial it down and there are special people who interpret it to make it understandable so you're not washed over by all the information. So I think uh, scientific illustration is definitely an essential part of being able to communicate what somebody you know on an explorer boat in Antarctica has seen or at least that's kind of I think it's a very important uh, branch but what I'm doing is, ba is basically um, get people excited about the beautiful nature beautiful nature you try to to show it and it's the frustrating thing I can only go in a super macro level you know I use sometimes electron scanning microscopes to do insect information, there's always you can always zoom in further and see another world of detail. So uh, I think illustration takes that and and brings it to a level that we that our brains can process it. That's kind of my uh, my take on uh, scientific illustration. A good scientific illustrator can can create discoveries for the people that look at those drawings. I think, but. And then the second question was, um, can you repeat that? How, how do you see scientific oh, art, art, art as, as in the broader context of fine art? No, yeah, so that, that was, I'm still stuck in that 1980, frustra being frustrated that people didn't call it art. Now when you see what, what, uh, what, what you know, artists do and what they show in exhibits and museums, there is a lot of, it's, I may know it's scientific art, but it's definitely reproductions of, of real objects, and it's considered high art. Uh, Damien Hirsch, for example, 
the guy with the shark, the shark in the shark tank, and uh, the the cow dissected. That is that guy is the most well-paid artist in the world, I think. At this moment, yeah, the art, the discussion about art is always. Uh, is there more that you want to say about it? Or? It struck the recollection in me of the, and I don't remember the artist, but who had the, the human bodies in formalin, you know, mm -hmm. in no, various were, were states of uh, uh, plastination. There was a German. Yeah. yeah okay. okay. This guy started as a, a taxidermist at a museum in Germany, and he discovered this method of uh, impregnating uh, organs with silicon, and he developed, he patented the system called plastination. And then he started doing all this outright. I'm, yeah, um, I don't. I, from my gut says it's not art, but uh, that's <laughs> that is just me. So. Well, but the fact that it's exhibited in an art museum and, and people come to see it as art rather than as a science lesson you know, means means. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's art when 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 people say it's art, right? It's like. Uh, it's also that uh, uh, the emperor was walking around with no clothes, and the only one that uh, realized that it was this little kid said, oh, the emperor doesn't have clothes on. I mean, there's a lot of discussions. That's why it was like that Woody Allen image that I had. It's a risky territory to tread. I have to tell you, that's not Woody Allen. Oh. It's my cousin Robert. Oh. <laughs> was, was actually in Kentucky. Friday. Oh, yeah? yeah. Oh, he, he, yeah, I, I know you, see, you look a little bit like, like <laughs> okay, you know the, exactly the scene, right? I know exactly. Okay, yes. sorry, so that's your brother Robert, awesome. That's cousin, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one more question? Yeah, this. Um, I just wanted to know, you had shown a side of uh, Mark Dion. What, what did you do with him? Uh, Mark Dion, uh, I... First of all, he did a project when the Golden Gate Bridge was 75 years old, uh, and uh, the celebration, there were uh, artists invited, he was one of them. He wanted to have objects that looked like they had been under the Golden Gate Bridge for 100 years or 75 years. He contacted us through, I don't know, people know this guy can do that, and he asked us to make turn these objects that he has found, brought in from antique stores, and like shoes and a bell, to treat it as if they are 75 years on the water. So, and then we gave it back to him and he put it in there. And then the second project I did with him, he did this fountain in the Netherlands and he wanted me to do the head and he had this sculpture and it looked like a link god. Uh, and I, uh, he asked me to work with him on getting that done and it gets done and now I'm working on with him on a project in Miami like gigantic heron sculptures and fish and stuff so it's like he's a, you know he's a that guy is really wonderful to work with uh, so I, I'm having a great time